Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And I hope you have uh, your Samtoons lunch and uh, you have regained your energy so that you can participate uh, here in our uh, webinar for this afternoon. So uh, again, thank you very much for attending to uh, this event. And I just want to make some announcements, especially for those who attended the AM session and have not yet filled out the evaluation form from their cert, uh, for their certificates. They may email uh, upbcss.lectureseries at gmail.com. So it will be uh, posted here sa ating uh, chat box. And also there will be a separate evaluation form and certificate of participation for the PM uh, panel, which will be shared during the question and answer portion after all the presentations uh, this afternoon. So those are the two important announcements that I would just like to uh, make, especially for those who attended the uh, morning session. So now we're transitioning to the PM ses uh, session and uh, we invited uh, three uh, speakers for uh, this afternoon. And uh, yeah, uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce to you the, the first uh, presenter for this uh, afternoon session. So he will be talking about forest, uh, pine forest fragments, uh, wildlife. So our speaker is uh, Professor Aris Reginaldo who is a faculty member of the Department of Biology at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. He has a degree in PhD in biology, uh, ecology and systematics, and he has been studying the ecology of pine forest fragments in Benguet, particularly in La Trinidad, in Busal Watershed and Count John Hay Forest Reserve since 2008. And Professor Reginaldo is interested in understanding how the conditions of forest fragments and pressure from urban areas affect the survival of Philippine rats, including one species known only in the Central Cordillera. So without further ado, let me uh, give to you Professor Aris Reginaldo. Sir Aris. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, pacheck yung audio natin kung okay. Yes, sir. It's uh, okay po. Okay, so good afternoon participants to the 113th Baguio Anniversary Lectures um, uh, sponsored or hosted or organized by a, collaborate, a collaboration between the College of Social Sciences and the College of Science. Uh, so again, so this is an opportunity for us. So we thank the organizer for inviting us to uh, participate in this very important uh, event. And the hope of our presentation, especially mine, is to um, affect our students and our policy making uh, institution and other uh, attendees to this that hopefully our scientific the scientific data that I'll be presenting to you today will be converted into policy that will help us uh, better manage our uh, our Baguio city or especially its uh, uh, environment or the, the habitats that we try to protect. So the presentation that I'll be giving today is a collaboration this is an ongoing project. Um, with the goal of really understanding the ecology of pine forests in Baguio City and other parts of Benguet. So the data that I'll be presenting to you today will, will date back as far as 2008 when we had our first field work here in Baguio City, especially in Captain Bay. So you can see that I shared the, um, the, the, the authorship of whatever information that I'll be giving today with our former faculty, the, uh, Professor Celia Ostra and our former thesis students, uh, Bonnet Ballesteros, Princess Gonzalez, and the more recent colleague that um, I collaborated with, uh, the late Dr. Perry Ong and uh, Dr. Lawrence Heaney. So the presentation is about Baguio and its pine forest fragments and the wildlife um, in these fragments. So first we ask the question, what is a pine forest? Um, defining this in a technical sense would be um, much harder than basing our definition on experience lang, di ba? Uh, so, but in the technical side, the pine forest is actually a special type of forest in the Philippines wherein it is dominated by 
the Pinus casilla. It's a species of pine known um, uh, native to the Philippines, okay? But this, uh, this species uh, uh, is restricted to the central cordillera. There's a related pine that is found in the Zambales region, but it's a different species. But the greater extent of our pine forest is located in our region here in the central cordillera. So most of you, when probably you try to imagine what a pine forest is, so it's used for recreation. So there are areas in Baguio City where uh, our pine forest, or pine forest, especially in Janhe and some other uh, places in La Trinidad, na ginagamit natin ito for recreation. So you could you can do biking there, hiking, and even just walking or spend spend the day there um, under the the pine trees and could just enjoy the pine forest as it is. Some of us would remember or, or consider uh, pine forest dif differently. For example, hikers would love the pine forest, seeing its luscious, uh, lush green vegetation, parang undisturbed condition, um, here, listening dun sa kanyang mga, dun sa mga wildlife na maririg natin dyan, just enjoying the view and the beauty of nature. And there are also um, several other uh, places na fragment natin, especially yung mga private owned natin na forest fragment in La Trinidad, plus in Kamjanhe, of course, the Yellow Trail and the Echo Trail, na ganito yung pwede mong experience. Um, and also for, for resource managers like um, the Baguio Water District, so they manage this, this, this fragments or this pine so that um, what uh, in the form of watersheds, because forest fragments in urban areas contribute a lot in maintaining a good source of water resource for us. Um, but just to going a bit technical now, um, so the, the forests in, the, in Baguio City are now turning more and more into fragments. So we can call the, this, um, this, this stand of forest na makikna nandito sa Baguio as pine forest fragment. Na kasi they are starting to be um, separated from the continuous pine forest that we see okay, along Halsima Highway or as far as north. So ito yung mga example na nilabel ko dito ng mga pine forest fragment. The largest of which is of course the Camp John Hay, which um, in this diagram, it covers up to the area that's managed by the DNR over here. There's an office of the DNR here. So ganyan, kalawak pa yan. And also the ones where PMA is... Um, is situated. So malaki ding tipak ng uh, pine forest fragment niyan. And there are also smaller fragments, much, much smaller than that. For example, Dr. Bawana mentioned a while ago this morning that there is Buyog watershed. So see how, it's small, how small it is. Um, and then there's also a relatively much smaller uh, fragment past uh, military cutoff. Then, you know, the Busol watershed, this is Ambiong. Ito na yung parang area niya ngayon, but this use to cover a much wider area that extends up to here, yung area ng La Trinidad. So, to border actually na yan parang Baguio, most of the, most parts of the Busol watersheds, yung vegetated part niya is now uh, only found in Baguio City, but the rest have, have been converted into an agricultural area. Uh, so, malaki ng, ba, malaki ng area yung nawala dyan. And then several other fragments na medyo mas, uh, maliliit pa, like for example, this is in La Trinidad. This is the popular strawberry farm over here, if you can see the mouse. Um, then there's a private owned uh, forest fragment there. And then this, is, this one is a government managed um, fragment. This is managed by PSU. Uh, and then another one that is managed by, I think this is Pugis Barangay, uh, which is uh, uh, continuous with the other uh, patch of vegetation that are here. But to put this in a much broader context, context no, the pine forest fragments are actually part of a much, much more extensive pine forest formation in the central cordillera. So if you move further to the, to the east, along um, the Lusatuba area and going, out, going down Ambuklao um, area, ganon, so pine forest lahat yon. And since Baguio City, and La Trinidad is located at the southernmost tip of the central cordillera. It's labeled here as red here. The pine forest formation begins, or if we start from the south, if you pass by the Cannon Road, so that's the area where you begin to see the vast, um, the, the mountains are covered with grass and pine, but this extends further north up to Kalinga. 
but only to a certain point. Much area of Kalinga is covered by what we call broadleaf type of forest. But the western section of the Central Cordillera, you could really see an expanse, expanse of pine forest formation. So ito yung tatalagang view na nakikita natin. So if you pass by Cannon Road, or dumaan ka na sa, I mean, along Halsima Highway going north further, if you went to Ifugao, to Bontoc, ganyan, ganyan walang kasa, magsasawa ka makakita ng ganitong pine forest formation. Puro pine, puro pangin. So bukod dun sa mga pangin, talagang pine lang at pine yung makikita natin na uh, formation. So yun siya. So yung mga nakikita natin sa Baguio City in the form of fragments are part of this continuous um, uh, cover ng vegetation, one type of vegetation na makikita sa Central Cordillera. Now, within the context of along an altitudinal gradient, let's situate this along an elevation gradient because in many parts or in all parts of the world, mag nagbabago yung klase ng forest natin along the elevations as you go up. So mapapansin mo, when you begin in Cannon Road or in, um, in Marcos Highway, hindi ka agad makakita ng pine trees, di ba? Broadleaf yung makikita mo. Ibig sabihin ng broadleaf, ito yung mga usual natin nakikita ng mga plants. So mas broad yung... Mas broad yung leaf nila compared to yung needle-like na type ng pine. So, ang tawag natin dyan, lowland forest. But as you reach yung ating uh, sa tuba area, biglang magbabago yung vegetation. Magiging grass. Then eventually, pag sampa mo sa Baguio City, makikita mo na yung pine. But if you pass by Cannon Road, magkaiba yung experience. So, early on sa Cannon Road, pagka pataas ng pataas na yon, sisimula na makita yung malalaking pine. Because beginning from about 800 to 1,000 meters above sea level up to 2,000 meters sea level, the central cordillera is unique okay? because that entire band of vegetation cover consists of pine. So we have our own pine forest. This is in contrast to other areas, all other areas except Zambales. Okay? Na yung layer, yung, yung elevation na yan, ang ang, ang ang kanilang forest type ay broadleaf type or yung mga usual na forest na meron tayo. Okay, so in terms of its ecology, simple lang yung ecology niya uh, ng pine forest just like the other types of forest. Similar to the pine forest in other countries in North America and Northern Europe, maintained by fire din yung ating pine forest dito sa Pilipinas. Ibig sabihin ng maintained by fire, Kaya may pine trees kasi merong fire. So fire is an agent of the existence ng pine forest natin. So given this um, condition, we now start to begin as the, probably to ask the question, kung ganyan yan, meron bang wildlife na pwedeng pumunta dyan or makakasurvive ba yung mga wildlife na nandyan? So yun isang mahalagang tanong natin. No, napansin, napansin mo na rin siguro yung lower vegetation or yung tag the, the, the vegetation under the pine trees, iba-iba minsan yung itsura niya. Minsan parang grass lang, tapos yung iba parang medyo hindi mo na malakaran, tapos yung iba talagang hirap na hirap ka ng malakaran. Okay? A reason for these differences is because of the presence of disturbance lagi sa pine natin. Okay? So dahil may fire, so nalilinis lang, nasusunog yung vegetation, then from from us, from from the time of disturbance or the presence of fire, unti unting tutubo yung vegetation niya. So, from the time of disturbance up to a certain time, nagbabago yung stage or yung level ng growth or development ng vegetation sa ilalim ng mga pine natin. Kaya makakita ka ng iba-iba. So, in this illustration, for example, at, some, at one point in time, pwedeng from this early stage, magiging ganito siya, tapos magiging ganyan. Pero kung meron na namang disturbance, pwede siyang bumalik dun sa state niya na ganyan. So, pwedeng pabalik-balik na ganyan. So, imagine nyo yung buhay ng wildlife natin dyan kung may at maya merong disturbance. So, ibig sabihin na istorbo. So, that leads us to the question, kung merong wildlife dyan, paano, so, affect, affected, ba sila, affected ba sila dun sa changes na meron ang ating mga pine? So, definitely, the answer is yes. So let's turn now to wildlife. So the first, probably the first group that you could think of when you speak of wildlife in forests are the birds because these are the ones that you could easily observe. You could see them flying around or even hear their songs. So ito yung madalas din makita ng mga, mga bird photographers natin. So uh, 
masasagot na agad natin ano yung wildlife na nandoon sa pine forest natin. So meron naman, di ba? So in the presence of fire, pwede rin silang lumipat from one place to the other. Plants din, na mga conspecies, hindi naman nung maalis yan. Okay, so pag makakita ka ng mga maraming trees dyan na parang ganyan, so ibig sabihin, nagsusurvive yung mga yan. Pero the more na, mga, na hindi ka na nakikita ng, ng ibang klase ng plants other than pine, so, parang sabi mo, ay siguro madalas madisturb itong area na to kaya wala masyadong vegetation sa ilalim ng mga pine trees. But that's, these are not the group of wildlife that I'll be talking today. I'll be presenting to you the small mammals. These are the rats, the mouse, and the shrew. These are the, the a small group. I mean, this is a large group of mammals actually, but they're actually small uh, than the ones that we know, like elephant or giraffe, pero kapamilya niya. So an example of the mammal that uh, I'll be discussing or presenting to you this afternoon is what we call the Cordillera Stripe Shrew Rat. This is a central Cordillera endemic. Ano ibig sabihin ng endemic? Endemic means it can only be found in a specific location, nowhere else. There are two nouns modifying the word endemic here. It says central cordillera. Does this mean that this mouse is only found or can only be found in the central cordillera? Yes, nowhere else. Not in any other parts of the Luzon Island, not in any other parts of the Philippines, not in any other parts of the world, but only in the central cordillera. Okay, just in Baguio, and if you go up north, up to the Kalinga, dyan mo lang makita yan. Pagbaba mo sa baba, posible ang ibang species na. Now, so, meron na kayong clue. So, meron bang wildlife? Yes. Well, madaling intindihin kanina nung sinabi natin birds because they can just evade the disturbance. But for ground-dwelling species of animals such as rats, how possible it is for them to live in pine forest fragments with the condition that I presented a while ago? Okay, so what we are learning so far, it's not just one, but there are other four. In total, there are five endemic species okay, of rats that we recorded from pine forest fragments. So ito yung mga, ito yung mga examples lang uh, natin. So one that I've already mentioned, the Cordillera striped shrew rat, and then four others. One, another one, the, the Cordillera pine forest moss. This is also a central Cordillera endemic. One is Luzon Island endemic. The other is a Philippine endemic. And then another one is all Northern Luzon endemic. So endemic species lahat ito. When you say endemic, Para lang maintindihan nyo, the Philippine eagle is endemic to the Philippines. You only find this in the Philippine eagle in the Philippines. So ganun ka-importante, or at least yung level ng uniqueness ng mga species na nandito. May nabi yung sa IUCN status, hindi naman siguro sila threat, highly threatened kasi marami pa silang individuals, unlike the Philippine eagle. But just to make a point, that when you say endemic, they are very beautiful, uh, they are they are worth noting kasi dito lang natin sila nakikita sa Cordillera, sa Luzon, o kaya sa Pilipinas. Okay, um, let me just skip to, or maybe a brief on this lang. So when, kasi dito nga sila nakikita lang, so ngayon saan ba sila galing? So more likely, galing din sila sa ibang place, especially the Southeast Asian mainland or the Asian Asia-Europe land. But through yung natawag natin colonization, so at one point in time, may ancestor that reached the Philippines about seven, 7 million years ago, nakarating siya sa isla ng Pilipinas, which used to be, kung mapapansin niyo yung mapa dito, yung black outline na yan, yan yung modern day Philippines, but 7 million years ago, yung kulay green lang dyan, yung lupa. All the rest in light blue, nakalubog yan sa tubig, tapos yung dark blue, oceans yan. But of course, there's land na napunta na nila, and then from there, nagkaroon na ng speciation, tapos dumami na sila. Okay, some others beach here about 2 million or less than 2 million years ago and 4 million years ago. But it's a very, very long time. And um, kung, pa, kung bibilangan nyo, parang 3 lang yan na, 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 na dispersal event. Tapos ngayon, ang dami-dami na nila. Okay? 
So the, here are some photographs, the actual photographs, no, I, photographs of actual specimens that na we On the right, uh, on the leftmost corner, ito yung picture ng Apomis Abre. Okay, so super cute siya. Napaka-fluffy nung kanyang um, fur, ng, ang, ang kapal niya. Parang siya naka-coat lagi, hindi siya, naba, hindi, kaya siyang, hindi siya nababasa, hindi rin siya uh, nalalamig. Pero one one point that I would wish to present here, yung kanyang fur, ay yung kanyang whiskers na pakakahapa. Okay, maabot yung kalahati ng katawan. If you know your cat, hanggang cheeks lang niya o kaya yung ear niya, ganun lang sa kahaba. Pero in this case, mahabang-mahaba siya. Okay, so next question. Saan natin nakikita? So, good news, nakikita naman natin lahat yung mga, in, at least merong species na endemic sa mga fragments natin. Pero the, the, we, we are, the, the one that we are seeing is, there's a difference in the number of endemic species found in these uh, forest fragments. Okay? So, depende kung... Uh, at nakikita namin na parang nakarelate siya doon sa... Uh, nakarelate siya doon sa condition ng mga fragments na yan. Okay? So, next na question natin, bakit paano sila nandyan yung mga species na yan? Okay? So, nandyan sila kasi nakita namin na merong isa pang klase ng vegetation sa mga pine forest fragments. So we call this as the montane forest patch. So in addition to the pine forest that we have, meron pa tayo isang maliit na, na tipak ng remnant. Ibig sabihin, ito yung dating original forest ng pine forest, ay ng, ng forest natin. Ang tawag natin dyan ay yung broadleaf. So kung makita yung picture na yan, hindi lang pine yung nakikita yun, kundi marami pang ibang klase ng species na nandyan. So nakakalat sila. So for example, the place where we captured the species in Camp Janhe in 2008, yan yung itsura niya. And yung mga areas na yun, madalas sila makita along the streams. So if you follow itong parang dark outline here, but here these are the streams. Okay, so more likely, nandyan yung mga species natin. Okay, um... So what we are finding is that yung mga endemic species natin, they are protected from fire because of the presence of this vegetation. So in the presence of fire, pupunta lang lahat sila dyan, tapos kapag wala na naman yung fire at mag-grow at mag na naman yung vegetation, so sumasama lang sila. May mga times na nadodocument namin sila sa mga grassy area ng pine, pero madalang lang. Okay? So ang habitat talaga nila ay hindi yung buong pine fragment, kundi yung mga maliliit lang na uh, tipak ng uh, ano yun, mga spaces. So here are some insights and recommendations from this, from this on ongoing study. So we, we know that the number, the area, and the quality of the remnant mountain forest, yung maliliit na vegetation na yun, influences also the species assemblage and the way how the animals use the frogmets. Okay, next, we now know that despite the harsh condition, the general perception or condition that we know about pine forests, we know that these pine forest frogmets, no matter how disturbed they are, they still support endemic mammals. But as I mentioned, key to this ability of pine forest fragment is the presence of those smaller broadleaf forests. Okay? Good news, those small patches of mountain forests can expand. And when they expand, this is an indication that forest is regenerating. So, pwede silang lumaki and so therefore na aid niya. So, just to illustrate, no? so here is a diagrammatic illustration. The green here Yung line na yan, yan, yung stream area covered by vegetation, these ones are those patches of broadleaf. So this is within the pine forest fragment. But there are smaller types or there are smaller vegetation there that are different from the pine. So dun nakikita din yung ating mga endemic species. So if we predict, kung mag-expand itong ating, sorry, mag-expand yung mga veget maliliit na vegetation na yan at dumami sila in the absence of disturbance like fire, pwede rin mag-expand yung population ng endemic species natin. So mayroon yung consequence sa conservation. So parang dito pa lang naisip nyo na, so therefore, if I protect the, the small patches of vegetation, I'm also protecting the endemic mammals. Yes. So that's, the, that's why doon galing yung marang magiging recommendations 
ko or namin about the pine forest fragment. So one is we we believe that the current management practices in watersheds in Benguet must be reviewed. Okay. So what are the things that we can do? So direct intervention to help remnant mountain forest patches is key to maintaining the native population. So ano mga pwede natin gawin? Pabayaan lang natin sila mag-grow. That's one. If we want to intervene even further, then we can help by planting more native trees. But that would, may not be enough. A critical aspect of management is preventing the occurrence of fire. We have done that in probably in Busol, may mga nangyayaring forest fire. In Camp Janhei, meron kami na detect na ilan, but pero napaka rare non. But in areas where this is the pine forest fragment is adjacent to um, to uh, agricultural communities such as this, this is very prone to fire occurrence. So, kailangan natin tingnan yan. So we also recommend to avoid indiscriminate removal of vegetation dun sa pine kasi pwede natin matanggal yung mga seedlings ng, mga, ng ibang trees that can potentially become the, the trees of the pine. And then we also need to review the use of streams for agriculture or yung mga streams na nasa pine forest fragments natin na ginagamit ng mga agri sa agriculture kasi meron kaming na-detect na isa na deplete na yung tubig to the point na yung water level bumaba ng bumaba so wala nang stream sa forest fragment na yon so anong consequence so kung bumaba yung water level wala magsusuport ng plant vegetation natin so kung walang magugrow na vegetation likely masisira yung habitat ng mga animals natin okay so i think that's the last so thank you very much for listening Thank you very much, uh, Professor Reginaldo, for that uh, insightful and also the cute mouse and rats. <laughs> oh, nakakatuwa. May mga ganyan pala sa mga pine trees. Akala natin mga ano lang, no? yung mga pine cones, ganyan, and also uh, iba pang mga hayo. Pero may mga uh, iba't ibang species rin pala ng daga na <laughs> makikita sa uh, mga pine uh, forests. Okay, so later on, I think uh, our participants would like to ask questions or raise some clarifications. Okay, po. so thank you very much, Sir Aris. So let's uh, proceed to our second uh, presenter for this afternoon's uh, lecture. So let me introduce her to, to us. Uh, she will be discussing culture and sustainability in the Baguio Creative City. So our speaker is Ms. Verna Lisa Bautista. She is a currently working as an instructor in the political science at the UP University of the Philippines, Baguio. She recently finished her MA in Social and Development Studies at the same university. Ma'am Verna. Hello, good afternoon. I'll just share my screen. All right. Can I be heard, naman po? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my presentation today is entitled "Culture and Sustainability in the Baguio Creative City." So um, specifically, the original paper uh, from where this presentation is called from it focuses on the creative city as a path towards. Uh, sustainable urban development. So that was my capstone project for my uh, ME. And I uh, just presented it like exactly a month ago. So this is like a specific section or a specific part of that paper. So in that paper and in this paper, I, will, I am interested in looking at the concept behind the creative city as an urban development strategy. So I focus on identifying goals or the vision behind creative city plans and strategies. No, so um, this is interesting to me because, of course, I live in Baguio City and Baguio. Uh, is a creative city for folk of uh, crafts and folk arts. So I used a Baguio City and other creative cities too in my paper. So, yeah. 
Um, for, of course, first of all, we ask what is a creative city. So even though we live in Baguio City and we see the creative city uh, projects, no, there is still the question of what it is. No? So in the literature, what I found is that there is no one definition of the creative city. So in my study, I found different definitions and um, iterations of this concept. So the, the most dominant version, at least right now, is of the creative city uh, as recognized by UNESCO. No, in the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. So currently, there are there are these goals of the city. So I take note that I am looking at goals no, of the Creative City as an urban development strategy. So you see here six goals that are aligned to the sustainable development goals. So the goal of the Creative City, according to UNESCO, is sustainable growth and entrepreneurship, knowledge and skills, inclusion, equality, dialogue, urban regeneration, ecological transition, and resilience, social innovation, and citizenship. So we will be able to uh, expand on this um, later on. So there are many definitions, but this is usually what is followed because uh, current creative cities, existing creative cities are members of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, including um, Baguio City. Currently, too, there are seven types or kinds of UNESCO creative cities that are formally recognized. So we have creative cities of film, music, crafts and folk art, literature, gastronomy, design, media art. So I put here example uh, cities that we may know. And uh, here is Baguio City in uh, crafts and folk art. You see here, it's very interesting that each city has its own kind of niche, but it doesn't mean that this is the only creative thing that they have in their cities. Like for example, for Baguio City, uh, our projects for Creative City are not just for crafts and folk art, but also for visual arts and other forms of um, uh, art and culture. Yeah. So um, the census of uh, the Creative City, if we are going to describe or define it in the literature, would be these three. Okay. First, it is an urban development discourse, meaning it is something that is used by cities for them to develop. Okay, So there is something, for example, there are issues in the city that needs to be addressed. And the creative city sometimes is used as a solution for those, uh, for some crisis, some uh, problems. Okay. Um, it is also a package or checklist of policies or programs. Now, so we will see later the different kinds of uh, policies or uh, programs that are distinct to the creative city. And uh, lastly, it's an imaginary, a shared imaginary, because it represents a certain goal, a certain desirable goal for, um, for cities. So while there is no one formula for creative cities, as I've said, the creative city urban development strategy has distinct features and what I call uh, like flagship uh, projects that are common among existing creative cities. So in my paper, I looked at these cases no? and uh, uh, I came up with a list of uh, features and then, uh, flagship projects and programs for, for creative cities. Now, so in the literature and in existing creative cities, uh, creative city is considered or is described as a people-centered city. No, um, here, the goal is to attract people either to live or to go to the city for tourism. Okay, So in a creative city, it is assumed that it is rich with what we call creative human resource and that um, the city is being fueled by human creativity in its economy and also in its governance. So Florida in 2005 and 2002 also theorized what he called the creative class, which is a class like uh, he used it uh, in the same way as uh, Marx, Marx used the term working class. No? So ganon yung creative class. And he says that this is composed of people, creative people. And yung creative people, hindi lang siya artists, artisans, yun yung weavers, um, but also professionals such as teachers, uh, doctors, scientists. So sabi niya, now when you have these people in your city, it is possible that uh, the city will become more developed. It, the city will become more aesthetic you know, because it wants to attract these kinds of people to live and uh, to go to the city. Okay, And uh, these are the people whose talents and uh, other endeavors like their businesses 
uh, fuel the economic development of a city. Now, so other descriptions of people in a creative city are eco-aware people, talented, diverse, multicultural. Florida even called them bohemian, but he th- this is used in the context of artistic people, no bohemian people. So a creative city is a people-centered city, wherein the policies are directed towards uh, the attraction of people like this, people who are creative. Um, another key feature or a program of a creative city is the creation or the, main, the creation uh, and maintenance of certain creative and public spaces. So these are different public creative spaces no, that are distinct or that are in uh, different creative cities in the world. So here, this is in Yokohama, Japan. This is a creative center. This is in this is a planned creative center in Indonesia. This is also a creative space in Indonesia. And this is, I think, in um, in China. Plus, ito naman is in Baguio, in the Dominican uh, uh, hill, the, the diplomat. Now, wherein what we did, what the government did is to refurbish that uh, space that is no longer used or is just occasionally uh, occasionally used by tourists into a space wherein uh, creatives could do their work, could... Uh, could do their work and exhibit their work at the same time. So that's one distinct or key uh, project of creative cities. Another is in public spaces. The use of public spaces, the creative use of public spaces is another key feature of a creative city. Now, so yung public spaces na ito, hindi lang ito, uh, hindi lang ito yung mga uh, spaces katulad no, na pwedeng gumawa yung mga artists ng artwork nila or pwede silang magbenta ng kanilang mga artwork or ng kanilang uh, crafts. No? It could also be uh, green spaces. Okay? No, nabanggit kanina yung importance of green spaces and their ecosystem services. It, this is also being uh, recognized by creative city policies that you should keep creative spaces, uh, uh, green spaces, because according to Landry, for example, he said that this, is, this can be called the third space wherein people can communicate and um, mingle in the, in the city. So kailangan mo ng malalaki, uh, wide uh, green spaces for people to enjoy. And in other uh, cities, for example, here, this is a city in Germany, wherein they have this neighborhood wherein artists reside and they also uh, show their work. They also exhibit their work. They also uh, sell their work and they invite people into what they call art walks or creative walks. So this is a this is a space no, na, um, dun sila nakatera, but uh, they use it create in, in, in a creative manner. No, so ito naman yung Open Streets Day. This is in South Africa. This is in Baguio. Uh, wherein you see how spaces in the city are being reused. Okay. Uh, in other uh, reclaimed reclaimed by people. Like for example, streets are usually for cars, roads are for cars. But here you see people reclaiming the spaces for other uses such as recreation. For example, here uh, during Pag Sunday, makakakita ka ng mga cosplayer, ng mga artists, ng mga pamilya na naglalakad, ganyan. So uh, it's also a good uh, project no, of creative cities. Um, another key uh, program or what uh, changes the most no, in uh, creative cities is their branding. Okay. Um, in uh, creative cities, usually they are already centers of culture in their own city, in their countries. For example, uh, Baguio City is already known as a cultural center even before we became a creative city. We just use that uh, brand or that uh, identity in order to uh, focus no, or uh, highlight our identity as a city of crafts and folk art. No? So sa iba-ibang uh, bansa sa mundo, ganun din yung ginawa. They identified uh, their strengths at yun nga yung niche nila and then they rebranded. And this is very important because again, the goal is to attract people. No? So to, in order to attract people, you need to be, the city needs to be attractive, beautiful, and my concept dapat. And yung concept na yun for some cities are uh, is the creative city. Yan. Another key idea is uh, creative governance. Now, so nasabi ka na kanina that creativity should be should fuel life in the city, um, not just in um, not just in 
policies or economic, sorry, not just in the economy, but also in uh, the government. So um, the thinkers you know, behind the, the early creative city uh, theories says that uh, policymakers should also be creative and should uh, include iton, diverse and non-mainstream knowledges in governing the city. So this also includes participation of people. Right. But of course, the key, the very the core idea behind the creative city is their policies on creative industries, economy, and cultural industry. So nabanggit ko na kanina yung iba ibang categories ng creative cities like film, music, um, crafts, folk art, uh, design, media arts. Most creative cities um focus on uh governing or making policies that uh aim to mainstream. Okay, mainstream these creative sectors. Now, so some some of those cities are industrial at first, meaning their identity is very industrial. Then they turned it into a very cultural uh, identity. Now, so the question that we have is that now that we have like a sense of what a creative city is, is it sustainable? All right. So the the uh, short answer to that is it should be. Okay. It should be sustainable. So in my paper, I use this framework uh, that synthesizes relevant sustainable urban development goals, meaning etong social inclusion, resiliency, economic development, political inclusion, environmental sustainability, among others, should be the goal of a sustainable city. Meaning if you want to be sustainable, you should be able to have policies and programs that are aligned to this. And um, he, this framework is also aligned to the sustainable development goals, specifically SDG 11. Okay. An overarching goal is intergenerational equity and uh, an integrated approach to development. So yung iba dito nabanggit na kanina, resiliency. And uh, there we have many papers today on environmental sustainability. I wanted to focus on uh, two, which is social inclusion and intergenerational equity and responsibility. Because here is where we can see uh, the role of culture uh, in sustainable, uh, sustainability in the city. Okay, um, and here I focus on this because this is what is unique to the creative city. So in my paper, I did not just read about the creative city, but I also looked at other forms or other kinds of city strategies, such as green cities, resilient cities, uh, child-friendly cities, sa uh, safe cities, ganyan, um, smart cities. Uh, and I saw that there are similarities, there are also differences, but what is unique about the creative city, and uh, it's a possibility that it is, it's, you know, it's what it can offer, it, it, it is the uh, new thing that it can offer for sustainability, is its focus on culture, cultural heritage, and inclusiv inclusivity through access to culture. So intergenerational equity responsibility is at the core of the very definition of sustainable development, which is development that needs the, meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the needs of future generations. So in SDG 11, they uh, enumerated this and says that it, this includes preservation, protection of cultural and environmental heritage, reduction of ecological footprint, and environmental impact. So, so social inclusion among this usually includes access and participation to cultural life and the city's social fabric and cultural diversity. So nabanggit ko kanina yung mga creative spaces wherein they uh, repurpose certain buildings na hindi na ginagamit ng city uh, to become creative spaces. And in other countries, it, this has become sites of social inclusion because yung mga dating walang livelihood or yung wala silang sites or wala silang uh, spaces para magbenta, mag gumawa ng kanilang mga crafts, uh, nagiging napapakinabangan yung mga ito. And um, sa level naman ng common na tao sa isang city, um, yung access and participation to cultural life. Na may sense ka ba ng kung ano yung culture and identity ng city na tinitirhan mo? Okay. And social inclusion also includes uh, the city being livable and culturally inclusive and emphasizing on cultural value, arts, and community well-being. The argument here is that these are also important for sustainability. No, It's not just... Um, Yung kanina integrated development, all of those, uh, all of those uh, goals are very important, and that achievement of one goal contributes to other to other goals. So therefore, if we achieve the goal of 
preserving uh, and uh, protecting cultural heritage in the city, then it is very beneficial for the city as a whole. So for the case of Baguio City, I made it uh, as an example because yun nga, it's a creative city for crafts and folk art since 2017. And it also uses other, other city strategies. So it's interesting to see its goals. Kumbaga. Goals are very important for development because it shows the vision of a certain city. Okay? It shows the direction of a city no, na may plano, okay? may direction yung mga polisiya niya. And this is also where you can see uh, inconsistencies no? because you have all these plans but then you see certain policies that are inconsistent with these no? so therefore it's a good example no so pero in terms of ano uh, creative city and the goal of uh, protecting cultural heritage and um social inclusion medyo uh, nagpa-perform naman ng Baguio City in terms of this no? so this is from the reports or uh, reports uh, of the uh, of Baguio City in their monitoring uh, report for UNESCO Creative City and other sources. Ano yung mga programs, projects na pwede natin i-align dito sa mga projects or sa mga uh, goals na to. So, for social inclusion, uh, Baguio City had this goal of providing livelihood and capacity development for crafts. Okay, and they actually did this. So there are many, through the years that it is a creative city, there are many uh, seminar training uh, workshops, even during the pandemic, okay, even during the pandemic, and even support for artists, artisans during that time that uh, helped the livelihood of um, many artisans and artists. Establishment of creative centers for refurbished sites. There are many sites in Baguio that are no longer used or they are not attractive anymore. So what the government did is to renovate those and made, make them into creative centers. And now tourists come to, tourists and even people from Baguio go to the, those creative centers. And then yan, uh, aligned to the provide provision of livelihood is the offering of entrepreneurship trainings and seminars to the city's artists and craftsmen. And more importantly, uh, the improvement of access to local culture. Of course, there needs to be more study on this, like uh, the before and after of the creative city. But it has the goal of uh, doing this through the exhibits, festivals, and fairs. So yearly, we have the creative Baguio Creative uh, Festival and then uh, other festivals too that are sponsored by the government in partnership with other uh, agencies. So maganda siya para sa visibility ng, ano, ng, ng Baguio City kasi yun nga yung goal niya to attract more tourists and to improve access to culture sa mga nakatera dito sa Baguio. So isang prime example yung diplomat Heritage Hill and Retreat House, where its previous image as a haunted house was replaced through emphasizing its cultural and historical significance and a dedicated creative space for creative Baguio activities. So you can see that it's sustainable because, because it's an old building and uh, now it's being used for uh, something very productive and ayun, uh, towards the goal of uh, cultural uh, protection of cultural heritage. So this is coming from the report of uh, Baguio City and mga uh, exhibits. The Mandeco Quito is also uh, done yearly. Uh, for intergenerational responsibility, um, the goal here really is to, you know, leave something for the next generation so that they can experience the Baguio City that we are experiencing. Or they can experience a better Baguio City since we're doing all these studies for the betterment of Baguio City. No? So, yeah, and the goal is to uh, focus on cultural and historical significance of some heritage sites, preserving, reviving cultural practices like weaving. So there's this, I think, workshop that they... Uh, train uh, weavers and even ano, uh, tra uh, parang teach weaving to, to, to non-weavers so that uh, the cultural practice will be revived it will be uh, revitalized and also revived now, some some though are projects that are uh, modernizing weaving now, so there are also those kinds of projects and um, institutions in the city, like, for example, the Academe, the University of the Philippines, is also very supportive of this goal. Like, for example, the Museo Cordillera of UP Baguio 
uh, is uh, a repository of tangible and intangible heritage of the Cordillera and a living museum that is yun nga, aligned then with the goals of the creative city. And there are also ordinances uh, that shows the funding for culture and the arts in the city. And for example, the, the festivals, you know, there is funding for that. And later on, we will be Uh, we will be uh, knowing about the cultural mapping of the city's tangible and intangible cultural properties and resources. And again, these are very important because we want the next generations to, to know and also to preserve these, um, these uh, history, this, these practices. And the creative city is helping, uh, is very good in making this happen. Yan. So other workshops, and yan, ito, for example, uh, spaces that are identified in the city where you can, may, may tinatawag din tayong creative crawl, wherein you include um, parks, uh, creative spaces, yan yan. and even ano, forest bathing sa, sa John Hay, no? to, in order to, to feel the city. You know? So this is a way for culture Like yung culture naman kasi it's not just the weaving, the, the silver crafts, etc. It's also the way of life of people here. So that's also one thing that is being, um, exp- uh, parang we are being exposed to in the creative city plans and strategies. So my final question is that, so therefore in this idea of culture and sustainability, do we have a sustainable Baguio creative city? Yes, there is potential. No, because four years pa lang naman, pagka five years pa lang na Creative City yung bagger and now I know that there are many plans, many policies uh, in place and planned also na maari pang ma, uh, mapaganda yung mga projects ng city uh, uh, in relation to the Creative City. And uh, in, my, in my paper, I said that there's potential also for the Creative City to become an entry point for other city strategies like green city, smart city, safe city, because it could be a comprehensive development plan that could incorporate all of this. Okay, So for example, uh, if we want to have more green spaces, the Creative City could actually, if it is the, the flagship uh, project of the city, it is the development plan, then it can actually incorporate that plan to have more green spaces because it is it is good for a creative city. Yun nga, but um, ngayon, wala pang integrated development plan na nandi, nandito lahat. Yung mga nabanggit kayo na resilient, safe, uh, and green spaces, wala pa. No, primarily because uh, hindi pa gumagawa ng bagong comprehensive development plan. But it needs to identify the creative city, the green city, smart city, etc. as a key goal. No? And um, this is very important so that it would transcend local government administrations na hindi magbabase lang sa kung sino yung nakaupo. And uh, a critique na hindi ko na i-expand ngayon, but there are inconsistencies na, uh, for example, these are the goals of the creative city, but there are inconsistencies then with the policies in place. Like for example, we want to preserve Uh, public and uh, creative spaces, but there are these projects like the uh, market modernization and uh, the structures in Burnham that are inconsistent with these with the, with these goals. So we also need to look into that. Yeah. So yes, there's potential, but we need to work on it. So yan po. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mom Verna. Okay, so yeah, tuloy-tuloy na natin from uh, pine forest fragments to uh, culture and the Baguio Creative City. Now we move to the cultural mapping project of the city of Baguio to be delivered by architect Donna Tabangin. Let me just introduce her to, to us. Donna Tabangin is a licensed architect and environmental planner with 23 years of experience in the applied sciences as a faculty of the School of Engineering and Architecture of the St. Louis University in Baguio City. Adjunct to this, she was the officer in charge of the Engineering and Urban Planning Research Laboratory. She finished her bachelor's degree in architecture at St. Louis University and master's degree in urban and regional planning at the University of the Philippines School of Urban and Regional Planning at UP Diliman. She, was, she has obtained advanced professional certifications such as geographic information systems for land evaluation at the School of Earth Sciences in the Catholic University of Leuven, uh, Belgium, uh, 
Communications and Technology for Disaster Management at the United States Telecommunications Training Institute at Washington, D.C., and Disaster Risk Reduction and Management at Coventry University, United Kingdom. In 2016, after serving as a visiting researcher in technology entrepreneurship and design at the University of California, Berkeley, she founded the SLU Incubator for Research, Innovation, and Business, or CRIB Center. She recently joined public service as the city planning and development coordinator of the city of Baguio in July 2020. She currently leads the office which is in charge of the formulation of development plans, comprehensive, comprehensive land use plans, project developments and monitoring, urban master planning, and creative design for the city. So let me now give the uh, virtual floor to architect Donna. Thank you, Mr. Joao. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'll just share my slides. So thank you very much again for inviting me to this uh, research uh, lecture series. So it's been quite some time that I have been in a forum uh, similar to this. In fact, I think I miss it. Uh, being a researcher in my past life, uh, it's something that uh, I miss <laughs> a lot. But um, anyway, uh, what I'm going to present this afternoon is uh, what we have just recently concluded, the book one of the cultural mapping project of the city. So uh, this is for uh, this year, 2022. Um, I think I parang na set up ako ni Miss Verna to talk about cultural mapping and how uh, we are uh, proceeding with uh, the development plans of the city and how uh, we are looking into, uh, it's true what you said na kalat-kalat yung mga vision statements ng city and that's the reason why uh, our development plan and all other plans that the city prepares, we prepare 31 plans in the city are, uh, you know, like it was written by people in silos and uh, somehow they do not talk about uh, the same thing. But um, best assured that uh, we, were, we are working on it and hopefully that by the end of this year or early of uh, next year, uh, we have a more, uh, uh, a, a, the updated uh, city development plan that came from a stakeholder uh, a lot of stakeholder engagement because of course we want to make sure that uh, for this uh, updating uh, we cover what the stakeholders are uh, thinking of also or in this case academe I've been listening since uh, this morning I have been taking notes really and uh, rest assured that all of this uh, would somehow find its way into our development plans. Now, uh, for the cultural mapping project, uh, may I just get um, a little bit personal detail now because I, when we started the project, I have discovered some of the gems of the city, and this is one of it. And uh, when I was uh, listening to the first uh, lecture, Kanina, see Professor Aris, uh, he was talking of your ecologies in different elevations. And I think uh, it, this is a place in Baguio where I, I can say I fell in love with. And if you're tired of the hustle and bustle of the um, urban area, well, this is it. I never knew that there's this uh, place pa rin na ganito ang kanya environment within the um, city. And when you go there, ito yung meron sila. This is, a, I think, a special uh, or a species na um, nasa, nakikita na lang natin sa place na ito. And when you visit that area, uh, this is what you see dun sa mga sari-sari store nila and what they serve uh, during meetings sa Barangay Hall. It's a very sweet variety. It was my first time, in fact, last year to see red bananas like this. So this place is Happy Hollow. And uh, this is a very special place for the city because this is the only culture, uh, cultural ancestral domain. So, siya lang ang ancestral, ancestral domain dito sa city. Marami tayong ancestral cultis, we call it, ancestral land titles. But um, this place uh, really is uh, something special because as a domain, dito yung talagang um, uh, iisa lang ang location ng mga, uh, I think there are two um, uh, tribes na meron dito. But you can see dito sa photograph na to on the left side, ito na yung mga elders nila. 
eh da dito naman yung mga naka kneel sa harap at yung mga teachers nila dun sa high school and elementary school. Uh, you can see here Councilor uh, Kayabas kasi siya ang uh, chairman ng Culture and Education. Uh, this person beside him is uh, the IPMR. Uh, siya yung representative uh, for uh, the uh, tribes dito sa Happy Halo. But one of the things that the elders kept telling me when we were doing our cultural mapping there was they're so scared already because they are that old, they're close to dying already, that somehow the culture, the um, rituals, uh, the traditions that uh, they have with them might no longer be passed on to the young people. So we really uh, put in a lot of time. Now we concentrated on Happy Hollow because what we wanted to do was to present to them the cultural mapping of Happy Hollow the soonest possible time. Because of course, uh, what we would like, the city would like, is that malaman nila na they are important uh, members of the city. When we were there, sabi nila nakalimutan na ata kami ng city, naaway pa kami ng John Hay kasi meron kami parts ng domain na nasa loob daw ng John Hay. And somehow they felt that they were not really recognized as um, not just citizens of uh, the city, but as uh, members of a cultural community. So uh, we we speeded up the uh, development of the writing of this book and we presented it back to them for the reason that this is just the right time that they should have their raison the trap. <laughs> I'm trying this. So um, what this means is the reason for being nila. Uh, what is it really that makes them that domain? What is it, what is it that makes them? yung uh, seven tribes, uh, seven groups ang meron doon of different tribes. Wh what makes them these people? And I think that uh, with this uh, book that we have given them, when we're telling them that this is something which they can already incorporate in their school um, lectures sa curriculum nila, probably masolve din yung worry nila that uh, mag -e na with them yung mga... Uh, uh, tra traditions, traditions, uh, because they also say na even their uh, mga apo nila ayaw na rin mag-aral dun sa Happy Hollow Elementary and High School. They want to study outside. So they're really worried that somehow baka mawala na itong uh, mga very important for them. So that's what we did. And uh, we hope that in this semester with that book, yun na ang uh, discussion point ng mga estudyante doon. So, uh, ang sabi ko nga sa kanila is this book is written by them because they were the ones who um, uh, gave us that information critical to uh, mapping uh, their culture there. And the book is also about them. Even the pictures in that book is uh, about them still. So, they were really uh, very happy with it but Siyempre, uh, para sa akin naman is the sustainability of this effort. And uh, we hope that uh, somehow they will be able to carry on itong uh, naibigay na munti ng city for them. And somehow they would feel that they are really important members of uh, the city also. In fact, this is a group that the city should celebrate. Because um, in our cultural mapping, we found yung mga 100-year-old na residences, mga traditions nila na kailangan namin i-video, dito namin lang nakita. No? Uh, sa Ibaloy, uh, dito lang namin nakita na i-video namin and we were able to map it. So there are so many things. Sa so natural, covered din. Um, yung banana, for example, yung tunsoy, do you know what a tunsoy is? Yun yung uh, watercress. No? So you can find this here, there's a waterways nila. So it's a really a very special place with very special people. And uh, I'm very glad na we discovered them and we were able to uh, give them their cultural map. But let's get into what is this cultural mapping project. And this can only be possible when the city was able to um, partner with the national uh, Center for the Culture and the Arts. No? So uh, this is something that uh, uh, our mayor uh, did on the first year of his um, uh, term as a mayor because uh, he wanted that uh, we really get into this cultural mapping project the soonest possible time. So uh, what we did was uh, we partnered with NCCA. There was a MOA and immediately after uh, we started the training. I will show you the process later on. But at the very first parts of uh, this project, 
I will show you a video ano, which we published over uh, the public information office because we were calling out for uh, people who might be bearers or owners of cultural properties or knowledge na share nila para we can map them all. So uh, let me just play this video. Um, 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 Architect Donald, is there supposed to be an audio? Yes, there is an audio. Oh, we can't hear the audio po. Perhaps you can try to share for the audio. Uh, wait. Hey, Don, oh, maybe ako na lang mag-explain. Ano. So we ah, started with this um, prayer. We went to Don John and uh, they did this prayer for us for the success of the project. And uh, immediately afterwards, uh, we started uh, with, uh, this is um, Mr. Arvin Manuel Villalon, who served as our mapping consultant. So he's a consultant coming from NCCA. And of course, he explained to us uh, what is uh, Republic Act 166, how do we do the uh, cultural mapping, what is the process, what is the framework. No, so we were uh, really guided by um, the uh, the framework that uh, NCCA has already uh, prepared. In fact, there is toolkit ang NCCA. So for those who are interested in uh, knowing how to do cultural mapping, the process, the framework, and the context of how to do it, kasama siya dun sa toolkit na yan. And uh, si Mr. Villalon ang kasama namin throughout the um, the uh, mapping project. So we went around and we mapped all the movable, immovable, tangible, intangible. Uh, in Session Road, we have all these Art Deco buildings, which uh, somehow we have forgotten already. And um, he taught us how to do that map. Um, pag naririnig kasi natin ang map, we think of you know a geographic map. But mapping is uh, documenting everything possible about a particular um, cultural uh, uh, concept. No? So uh, we also were able to ask uh, permission. In fact, si Mayor Magalong uh, who has made it um, possible for us because he linked us to NCCA. And of course, uh, one of the things that he always assess is that uh, we have to get back to our past, really, our history for us to be able to understand the way forward. So ito siguro yung answer kay Ms. Verna, no? na siguro may missing part kasi that uh, we never really understood what would we have been our heritage, or what is our heritage, the culture of the people here in the city. Kaya hindi na natin, hindi na siguro na formulate yung ating mga development plans na isa lang yung kwento niya. Meron siyang isang framework, meron siyang isang foundation ba. And ito yung kulang, uh, yung cultural mapping na to, an understanding of our past. And of course, a celebration of all these things that makes us who we are. Rise on the trust, sabi nga, di ba? The purpose, the reason for our being, the soul of what makes us people of Baguio. So uh, he gave us his full... Um, support uh, to get through this um, project. In fact, uh, our uh, council also allotted 5 million pesos to undertake this um, program. So um, it's really very uh, important for us that um, the executive, legislative um, parts of the city come together. So dito naman, I am explaining na why, what is the reason why we plan? We plan because uh, it's not for ourselves, but we're thinking of the next generation already. It should be that we plan for seven generations, one generation being 25 years. So ganun katagal dapat ang outlook when we plan. Because ang idea natin is to make sure na this is passed on to the young people, the, young, the next generation of the city. So it has to be documented already, ma sa libro siya, and may sama siya at least doon sa uh, curricula, uh, especially for our elementary and um, high school. No? Para ito na yung common story natin. Meron tayong um, book to refer to 
because this was a very thorough um, research. So we went to different um, culture bearers, we called them. No? Uh, we interviewed them, we, we, uh, we got a video of them. We, we sought them out because, of course, um, the best na, uh, source of information would be the eldest member of um, a particular area or a tribe or a group. So uh, one thing also that we wanted was uh, that uh, we should be ready for climate and disaster risks, no? because uh, especially for tangible and immovable na, uh, uh, elements ng cultural mapping, kailangan meron na tayong plan on how to uh, preserve, conserve, as well as to protect them. So it's really very, very important for us that uh, we already have all these uh, plans put together, but kailangan lang talaga is magawa itong cultural mapping project na ito. So what I'm saying here now is that ito na yung magiging platform for all the plans that the city is going to um, to create or update. And that's the the instruction really coming from our mayor. Na this time, dapat yung plano, meron ng soul dun sa... Uh, and it goes back to this uh, output natin sa cultural mapping. So in this video, we ended with this um, uh, uh, announcement na makinayon no? to share their stories para uh, meron kaming uh, starting point dito sa cultural mapping. So uh, with makinayon, uh, when we uh, published this uh, video and uh, a few days after, uh, we were doing our initial identification of um, kung ano ba yung dapat naming imamap. So uh, we identified 200 initially, but after Makinayon, there were so many who uh, gave us information or asked kasi sila yung owners to be part of the cultural mapping project. So from 200, naging 600 plus siya, but because of yung um, budget allotted, it's uh, just 5 million, we were able to do 230. Actually, ang goal lang with the 5 million was 100. Uh, items or uh, any of the five that's uh, listed, listed down here. So uh, 200 to 600 and what we did we, was uh, we completed 230 and that is book one. So dito sa book one, meron tayo yung intangible heritage, tangible and immovable, tangible and movable, natural heritage and institutions and personalities. So we just selected uh, those items that which we can uh, completely map but uh, the council again gave us another 5 million budget so that we can do book two. So book one is very thick. No? It's uh, like 10 inches uh, thick. So we divided it into uh, four volumes para uh, handy and readable siya. So um, that's what uh, we have right now. And uh, we, launched the, uh, we launched book one uh, during our September 1 Body Day celebrations. Right now, we're just uh, going through uh, another round of proofreading just to make sure that uh, we didn't uh, omit uh, or we didn't uh, uh, we checked on any errors and we didn't omit on any uh, important items. So just give us time. Um, we actually hired uh, mga proofreaders natin uh, coming from universities, now UP, SLU, and we're very grateful that uh, the specialists in these uh, universities uh, agreed to proofread um, these uh, books because really we wanted na uh, once published, it's really that's it already. Uh, it's complete and information that's uh, there is correct. So uh, that was really uh, what we have intended all along. So these are the steps of the cultural mapping. Um, Project. So we started with scoping and negotiation. The case of Happy Halo, we have to get their free and prior informed consent because, of course, um, dapat naintindihan nila kung ano yung mangyayari sa project na to and ano yung output and uh, ano ba yung kanilang share in this um, development of uh, this cultural mapping. Next is uh, we did social preparation. So for every uh, every part na ma cultural map siya, kailangan i-explain din namin sa owner or the bearer so that uh, they would also know kung ano yung magiging implications of them joining this project and what would be the outputs. The third step is the training of the local team. So the city hired 16 mappers, multidisciplinary sila. We have a biologist, 
We have an expert in history. Meron din sa performing arts, architecture, and engineering. So we made sure na kung ano man yung uh, item doon sa uh, cultural mapping, anong domain man siya, meron tayong uh, mapper who is uh, more or less um, in the know or at least an, uh, or at the very uh, least an expert on that um, topic. So uh, 16 sila. And then we proceeded to data gathering. Uh, that was December already of uh, last year. So we spread out and uh, we already with that 200 list, uh, yun na yung, uh, we went to those different places and personalities and mapped them. We conducted a lot of interviews, uh, video, videography, a lot of photography and documentation. It's a lot, very rigorous ito, itong cultural mapping. I'll show you an example of an output later on. And then we conducted data validation. So uh, we invited uh, yung mga naging um, resources namin, uh, yung mga culture bearers, and we showed them kung ano yung uh, na-document uh, what they have uh, shared with us so that they could validate and the community could also validate along that that is indeed what uh, that uh, domain is all about. Then afterwards, we finalized it. Yan yung na-launch nung September 1. But you will see that meron pang two steps um, missing and which we're about to pursue right now, the one on the right side. First is uh, we have to make use of this data already. So it's still data. The more important thing is we analyze it. In, and of course, the results of that analysis would guide us in the planning already. And the most important thing really is to the utilization. Sana natin gagamitin ito kasi yung nga naman yung void before um, parang kulang sa sa spirit, kulang sa soul yung mga planong ginagawa dito sa city. So uh, that is the first thing but we can find other uh, uses for the this output because like say for example sa DepEd, eto na yung part nung um, I forgot ano yung subject nila but this is going to be yung point of discussion nila. Ang maganda dito, it's really ours. It's our story. So ito na yung ma maituturo dun sa mga estudyante. So it feels so good that that's going, be, going to be the discussions already in our elementary and high schools. So this is an example of an output. Uh, so it's quite um, long. Um, this one is a map of the significant intangible cultural heritage. Um, the element is the badiw. So this is a chant, as you can see, uh, dito sa first part, number one, background information, we have to uh, point out ano ba siya. So in this case, it's a chant. We also were required to take, an, aside from videography, meron siyang photography, no? And then uh, we have to get into a discourse, uh, geographical location and range of the element. On the left side, you will see, uh, we also relate it to other domains of the intangible cultural heritage. So it's um, also within the performing heart per, performing arts domain, social practices, as well as knowledge and practice. Uh, part two is a description of the intangible cultural heritage. So you can see it's quite uh, long. No? We, we made sure na we did the uh, research uh, about uh, this, um, this particular um, heritage. And you will see now we went as far in, in this case, ang badiw kasi is a chant. Uh, we were able to uh, research out paano ba yung uh, denotation ng isang badiw. And then here on the right side again, you will see yung uses na. It's on weddings as well as on um, uh, Thanksgiving, wed uh, weeks. Uh, so na, na lista lahat yan. And I think the most important part is ito, itong nasa lower right hand the elders who are still practicing it. So you will see here na nilista rin namin yung cultural directors, naman bono, the cultural masters, nandyan sila. So that just in case, no, if um, kayo, when you, if you want to carry this on as another research, everything's here already. Or hindi man siya nandito, you can add on to it. And you have the resources available to you already. So this is uh, the other pages. So you will see that we also listed down yung uh, mga attached na significant tangible heritage to this element. So in this case, the tafe, no? which is a very important part of the ritual. Uh, part three is uh, the stories or the narratives associated with the elements. So very important ito. 
na tin uh, tinanong namin yung mga uh, key informats ano ba yung mga stories uh, related to it it's very interesting really and then um, I skipped several pages because it's quite long but on the last part you will see here that we included measures and description of safeguarding. Kasi yan naman talaga ang idea nito eh. How do we safeguard it already? In this case, in this case the body is um, safeguarded through transmission, particularly through non-formal education. And then very clear dito uh, yung listing for references ano? because we know that this would be carried on for other uh, research researches. Uh, we have audio and video recordings, we have photographs and sketches, and we also have music, musical notation. So just in case somebody wants to get into research on this, uh, there, are, um, there are resources that are available for you already. So uh, we also listed down yung key informants. This is very important as well as the other references that we use. You will see marami po kaming ginamit na resources from UP Baguio. And uh, the name of the mappers as well and the date that it was profiled. So ganun po ka rigorous to. Kaya ang kapal po ng output nito, 230 10 inches thick uh, in total for uh, this um, book one of cultural mapping for the city. So this is uh, a, a photograph po when we did the validation. So we invited those whom uh, we, yung mga key informants po, sila rin din nandito. And we invited academe and other stakeholders para po ma-validate na kung ano man, whatever it is that was mapped, that is really what it is. And the same, yung story nung na-map to all of us. So that was uh, very important. And of course, uh, one thing which I really liked about the validation part was uh, everyone was so happy each time a photograph was flashed on the screen, like the Marapait. Everyone remembered the Baguio of before. In, uh, if you know kadang kadang, do you know that uh, game or that uh, plaything na ginagamit before? Everyone was so happy, na, especially the elders, uh, those who are the seniors already. It reminded them of the Baguio that they know, and probably uh, for the new, uh, for the young people, uh, the new uh, residents of Baguio, this might not be uh, known to them anymore. So uh, this is an example of yung mga cover pages namin ng for book one, four volume siya. On the right side, you will see very long talaga yung this thing. No? We did as much as we can, although we cannot say na complete na ito. Probably meron din kayong ipapadagdag later on for book two. Please just tell us because it's most important for us na na-document lahat to. Mawala man siya, at least in memory and in this book, nandun pa rin siya. Something to make sure na um, it, this is already uh, recorded for history. Um, the results pa of this, uh, the entire book one will be submitted to the Philippine Registry for Cultural Properties or the PRECUP. The intention here is makoconserve na siya, mapre-preserve, and it gets protected. So whatever it is that we have mapped, it's up for protection already, which is really the most important part. If we really intend na itong lahat ng mga cultural properties and elements is something that we would carry through no? beyond our generation to the next and the next generation has to be documented, has to be taught in school, and it should also still be practiced. So that's the most important thing. So um, we already are developing the executive legislative agenda for this um, uh, uh, new set of uh, political leaders, now, so 2022 and 2025. And I'd just like to show you how uh, we are getting into the planning already of the uh, triple bottom line ng city. No? It's on uh, maintaining our environmental ceiling, strengthening our social foundations, as well as promoting economic recovery and resiliency. You will see on the left side, itong four important parts, which I think are very important as um, uh, a result and an input to the cultural mapping. Natin. Number one is, uh, since we mapped our natural heritage, then we have that bottom line already of how we will revitalize the green and the blue assets of the city. SIDRA is Climate and Disaster Risk Assessment. So I mentioned earlier that it's very important for us that we also protect this um, heritage already. They may be sites or they may be people 
dapat um, uh, protected sila. Another thing is, uh, like the story of Happy Halo, there has to be a way na may resolution na ng IP land issues natin. And of course, yung land tenureship. Now, since until now, marami pa rin nagsasabi na walang domain, walang ancestral lands dito sa city, how can we make sure na kung ano yung traditions to on their way of life, the indigenous knowledge is protected when in fact it's grounded on land. Diba? So that's something that uh, the city has to work past already, the resolution of these issues. Next is to promote indigenous knowledge. So with this, this is the first part really, the book is towards this, uh, the promotion of indigenous knowledge. And you will see that in our plans later on, we're going to be very clear on um, uh, this uh, part. And then last would be to raise cultural and historical awareness, not just for the children, but all the members of this Baguio community. This is something that's very important for us. It should be shared. The story should be a common story for all of us. And uh, for the next steps, uh, we're going to conduct the utilization workshop. Please join us. We will invite you. We will establish a Heritage Conservation Council. We will also develop a heritage plan. So uh, rest assured, this is going to be done with the stakeholders so para po yung mga kuro-kuro natin na, na nakalagay dito based from what we have mapped. Number four is to develop an ordinance for safeguarding the cultural heritage of the city. This is something that's very important because sometimes um, hindi na nila nakikita yung economic importance ng old na structure and they wish to change it or to uh, bring uh, put it down and um, build a new uh, structure, for example. No? Uh, one, one time pa, meron akong na-receive na application for a renovation of building permit and um, dito sa session road siya. And um, uh, it's on a building na uh, it is... Uh, it is uh, ang design, ang architectural design niya is um, art deco. And ang gusto ng uh, designer is lagyan niya ng wood veneer, yung art deco, eh, counter yon sa design ng mga art deco structure. So you can see na nawawala na yung importance nito. And that's the reason why uh, we wish that our, uh, our council this time with the uh, cultural uh, mapping uh, output may ordinance tayo on safeguarding. And last is the cultural map should guide our city plans as well as our investment plans. There should be a specific portion of the investment plan of the city that is allotted to conservation, preservation, protection of this um, heritage that we already have mapped. Um, uh, other things we are doing, we are truly mapping it this time on geographic uh, space, no? kung nasaan yung mga na-map na natin. Kasi this would also help us, uh, like what Miss Verna said, yung uh, uh, cultural uh, walk around the city or uh, something uh, because uh, a visit to this uh, important uh, historical uh, buildings of the city. So we're doing this already. And we're also creating heritage zones so that this becomes a part of the land use plan, magiging part of the zoning code of the city. Para kung heritage zone siya, merong mga allowable and non-allowable na uses and designs already. Diba? Yun yung kailangan, kailangan natin. Eh. Hindi very tight yung story when it comes to uh, the heritage uh, of uh, the different parts of the city. In fact, we are thinking the sa land use, uh, each barangay or each community, iba-iba na yung ating mga uh, zoning para sa kanila. Para merong, uh, meron bang uh, storya na very specific lang doon sa areas na yun. I think this is uh, one of the important things para the sense of place tayo. We are part of a community. There is a story to tell about our place and about our community. Uh, if I go back to Halo, Happy Halo, uh, yung kanilang... Uh, cultural mapping, siya na ang magiging very important part ng kanilang ads DPP. Ads DPP is the Ancestral Domain Sustainable Development and Protection Plan. So uh, we're helping them develop this uh, with the uh, mapping uh, uh, as our framework. 
para we get into uh, yung uh, protection already because environmentally critical yung area nila. In fact, parang dalawang ecologies ito sa high, higher elevations ito where you see the pine trees and then dito on the Itogon side, ito na yung mga broadleaf which uh, Professor Aris was talking about. So you can see uh, yung mga ganyan dito sa area na to. And uh, we wish na meron ding uh, study later on ng uh, environmental boundaries dito sa area which might help us dun sa protection part. And of course, uh, one of the things that's very uh, important really is yung stewardship of the people who live there, no? yung mga the seven uh, tribes that are there. And of course, uh, conservatorship of culture. And probably this is the time already, no? may baseline na tayo, eh. meron na tayong cultural map. Why is it uh, what's stopping us now for creating an indigenous land use and zoning, di ba? Western kasi ang land use and zoning uh, concepts and frameworks. So why not uh, Why not in this time around, uh, since we have this uh, cultural mapping, we have this specific community to be our uh, starting point. Now, let's explore. Meron bang pwede na yung, so from their knowledge na makakatulong in the way that we do our indigenous land use and zoning already. So um, that's our cultural mapping project for the city. And of course, it always redounds back to this uh, mission. One mission na lang siya, Ms. Verna. A better Baguio. One hope, one Baguio. Rest assured, by December po, uh, we have that um, updated development plan where really the vision is straightforward, just one vision towards a future based from the heritage and the culture that we have in the city. So uh, thank you very much po, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much, Architect Donna, and thank you for walking us through the uh, urban spaces, uh, especially here in Baguio City, and also some important tangible and non-tangible cultural heritages um, that we still have uh, here in the city. So. Uh, now we are proceeding to the next part of our program, which is the question and answer portion. And I would like to uh, respectfully ask our panelists, our uh, presenters, to please uh, turn on their cameras. And yeah, and we will be reading uh, the questions. Uh, there are questions that are directly addressed to uh, a presenter, but if you have other insights you may want to uh, contribute to the discussion so that uh, we will all learn and yeah, uh, have deep understanding of this uh, topics that we have. So the first question po, uh, we have in our Q&A box regarding Baguio Creative City. I think this is uh, directly addressed to Ms. Verna. Uh, to clarify, do urbanization and commercialization hinder creative cities from achieving their goals or do they rather complement it? Let me just read uh, the question again. Regarding the creative city, to clarify, do urbanization and commercialization hinder creative cities from achieving their goals or do they rather complement it? Um, uh, for that question, so yung urbanization, kasi nun, it's a process that is ongoing and it's also the process that is being responded to by the creative city and other urban development strategies. So um, does it hinder, uh, if we are talking about urbanization in terms of, you know, urban decay and uh, the other negative, uh, the crisis, no urban crisis, then definitely it hinders creative cities from achieving their goals. But the goal is to have a more sustainable urbanization. So as for commer commercialization, um, uh, one critique of the creative city is that it kinds of uh, commercializes culture, uh, objectifies uh, some cultures. You know? So it depends on the city, of course, you know, on whether there is a balance between their goal of social, uh, their goal of economic development and um, the, the goals that I have discussed, such as sustainable uh, sustainability, intergenerational equity, and social inclusion. So commercial, commercialization to the to a certain point, like kung magbibigay ka ng livelihood, ganyan. But if it goes to the point na 
na objectify na yung culture, which is a critique talaga of creative cities, then definitely, hindi siya nagko-complement dun sa uh, goals ng uh, sustainable develop, urban development goals. Yan po. Thank you, Ma'am Verna. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, the, the next question is also about creative city again uh, for you and also could be for architect or for Professor uh, Aris. To creative city presenter, Baguio City is a multicultural city. Thus, the culture, quote and unquote, being referred to or being promoted may not resonate with all Baguio residents. How is this being considered or responded to in the Baguio Creative City Planning for its sustainability? So Baguio City is a multicultural city, thus the culture, quote and unquote, being referred to or being promoted may not resonate with all Baguio residents. How is it being considered or responded to in the Baguio Creative City Planning for its sustainability? Um, maybe I can answer the first part of the question, but uh, I have no, uh, hindi, hindi ko masyadong sure dun sa paano siya nagbiging considered or uh, paano yung response ng planning for sustainability. Now, because there really is an issue. It is an issue in the sense that actually dun sa beginning ng Creative City when I first met this term, noong 2019, during the International Conference for Southeast Asian Crafts and Folk Art, the first question was that for whom is the creative city? No, for sino bang nagde-define ng development nito? And then when you look at the projects and programs of the creative city, um, yung culture na pinapromote is more of the indigenous culture, more of the indigenous crafts and folk art. Kaya tayo crafts and folk art. But at the same time, it is also promoting um, um, arts and the works of uh, Baguio-based artists na hindi naman necessarily indigenous. So, um, may issue din doon na yun nga, na baka hindi nag-resonate sa mga tao yung both both of those na, na pinapromote yung culture by way of uh, selling crafts or exhibiting folk art, ganyan, na baka hindi masyadong naiintindihan. So, but I know that there are uh, that there are exhibits, there are programs that are also educating people on this. No? So dun sa last part na, how does the city plan for this? Uh, maybe may uh, input si Ma'am Donna, Architect Donna. Yes, um, that is uh, really something uh, the city is looking into, especially for the city development plan since uh, it's being updated. And uh, very important kasi na ang ating a uh, creative city is very clearly stated and yung strategy niya very clear din dun sa development plans natin so um we are doing that um we are putting uh, yung mga necessary information dito in fact you've seen dun sa slides ko na nasa land use siya nasa zoning siya mag appear din ito definitely dun sa development plans natin so um that's being done and uh, once uh, we we launch uh, the new and updated uh, city development plan, uh, it's going to be there, clearly. Thank you very much for that uh, input, Architect Donna. I think uh, this question, next question, is also addressed to Architect uh, Donna. Uh, this is a question from our uh, colleague, Simam Ram. Uh, architects, some of the tangible heritage places are owned by the national government, like Features Camp, Court of Appeals Compound, Supreme Court Compound, the Mansion, etc., Cabinet Hill. Uh, how does the city handle or manage this to ensure these are preserved? Yes, um, the 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 zoning code is uh, a local code of the city. Once na, na nandoon na yung ating uh, um, requirements or uh, the, uh, uh, the what we need to include on in terms of yung conservation and the uh, preservation of these uh, cultural heritage sites and buildings, um, they, they will have to follow. Kasi uh, ano man ang gagawin nila later on, if they are going to renovate it, they will have to pass through our permit processes. 
So that means na uh, ma ma makikita natin uh, what is it that they intend to do. Uh, that is through our uh, zoning code. So yun actually ang pinakamagandang lalabasan as an output dito sa ginawa natin cultural mapping because it's a code, a law, uh, we have to abide by it. Uh, even the nat national government will have to abide by it. Um, the other thing is, uh, meron namang uh, interagency cooperation. So um, I'm very sure naman, in our talks with DNR because of yung sa Governor Pak, that's where we have yung ano, Divine Baden Powell, may marker siya. So um, we were talking to uh, with DNR and Boy Scouts because they are the owners of these properties. And we were telling them that uh, dito sa mapping namin, uh, it's very important really na, uh, lalo na yung Baden-Powell, natakpan na siya eh, ng mga stalls, di ba? Ay, hindi na nakikita. Eh. That's very important uh, na sa, par sa history ng city. They agreed actually. Uh, in fact, meron kaming memorandum of agreement with Boy Scouts na in three years' time, they will start removing the um, stalls in front of Baden-Powell Inn para lalabas yung Baden-Powell Inn. They will uh, renovate it. May conservation plan dapat yun. And yung marker na nasa baba ng eaves nung, uh, I, I, I forgot ko ano yung building na yun, ililipat na siya sa original location niya in front of the Badal Baden Powell in na merong uh, parang lawn in front. Nag-agree ang Boy Scouts niyan. And then dun sa may bus terminal area, since syempre kailangan is uh, isang uh, malaking urban plan yan para uh, hindi katabi nung maganda, eh, pangit ulit. No? It cannot happen like that. Um, Nag-agree ang DNR, we can get into a memorandum agreement with them so that the city can also propose how the development of that area can happen with respect to yung uh, preservation idea natin for Baden-Powell Inn. Right now, we're currently talking with um, the ICT dun sa post office. Diba? The post office building is another very important structure sa city. Pero anong nangyari? Because ang, uh, ang requirement daw ng uh, national sa local na post office is they should be entrepreneurial. Eh di pinali, pinaliguran na ay uh, meron nang nakaskirt around it na mga shops na takpan na yung architectural design ng post office. So you can see that can happen also. It just has to be na we initiate this talk pero kailangan meron tayong pinanggagalingan. And that's uh, where yung cultural mapping comes in. Okay, thank you po, Ma'am uh, Donna. I think there's another question here. Uh, again, addressed to you, architect. Uh, if and when places are recognized as heritage places built 50 plus years ago, apart from the markers, what are other strategies that the local government does to support the preservation of this structure? For instance, St. Louis Center. Yes. Um, that's the reason why um, dun sa ways forward ko, uh, number five there is um, yung ating conservation and preservation no, of uh, those which we have already cultural map should find its way dito sa plans natin and more importantly, sa investment plan ng city. Every year na dapat dyan is merong money allotted to uh, for the uh, either the city will uh, implement it by its own or uh, possibly as a grant to yung uh, uh, bearers or the owners of yung mga cultural properties na yan. So we still have to uh, thresh this out now. But these are just uh, initial thoughts coming from us dito sa local government. Uh, it, it, we still have to... Uh, be um, formulated um, in in clearer terms. But uh, yun lang naman yung kailangang mangyari. Lumabas na siya as part of the annual investments of the city towards conservation and preservation. Thank you, Ma'am Donna. Let's uh, dito? go to another uh, topic first and then we'll return to the creative city. To Professor Aris, there's a question here. Sir, what is the significance now of these endemic rats to the Cordillera ecosystem? Are they not considered as pests in some agricultural fields? What 
I think what is the significance of these endemic rats to the Cordillera ecosystem? Are they not considered as pests in, in some agricultural fields? Siguro idagdag ko na rin yung pangatlong tanong, Sir Aris. Can we consider these endemic rats as natural heritage, which can be included in the cultural mapping <laughs> project? Of, Basically, um, isunod ko yun, no? pero sana na-intindi ako. Okay, so yung tungkol dun sa uh, importance, Yes, definitely, especially if these are endemic species. Um, when we say endemic, these are natural residents of any ecosystem. So if you, we are speaking of their ecological significance, they are primary contributor to whatever, um, whatever ecological processes that are happening to our forests so because they are the original residents of yung ating mga natural forest ecosystem. Um, Based on documentations regarding yung sa pesto, based on documentation, they are none of them are actually pests. But uh, the good news is one of them, the Crotomys white white head, which I think became has become the the favorite rat at this time. You may stripe dito, was recorded to actually uh, be uh, is helpful in agricultural activities in the Ifugao area because they documented na nakakumakain siya ng pest earthworm and possibly yung golden kuhol na sumisila ng mga sumisira at nakakasira ng palay. So na document nila that it's been moving around yung agricultural area yung species na yon. So it has the potential indeed to um to be helpful dun sa mga agricultural ano natin. Now in terms of yung natural heritage, I think um yes, uh, but of course yung value it differs. Uh, kasi even, even the treatment of wildlife vary among ecologists and even especially when it moves to the social, uh, I mean, the public, the Philippine eagle, of course, is a natural heritage, undoubtedly, because of its size and its popularity, its low population, and because it's, it's endangered status, kaya na-elevate ng ganun yung importance niya. But as I highlighted a while ago, yung endemic species dahil nga dito, na, dito lang natin nakikita sa Pilipinas or more specifically sa Central Cordillera, then this is something that all, that all Cordilleran people ma, must be proud of. Kasi no one else, no one else in the Philippines or on Luzon can see species such as the one that you have here. I'm from Cagayan. We don't have that. Pero pag nakakita ako nung stripe rat na yun, parang napaproud na ako kasi wala. Yung parang yung ganun yung sense, yung ikaw lang yung nakakita, nakikita, parang nasusubaybay mo yung buhay niya. Although, siyempre, hindi niyo pang alam na nandyan sila. So I think in that sense, the more that we, we, we make, make organisms popular and appealing to the general public and hopefully makapture ito ng government, that's why I also agreed to, to have this talk kasi akala ko mga government officials natin, yung audience natin, uh, but maganda pa rin na may mga grupo ng social science, magiging social scientists dito, and then they could see the value of wildlife um, in, in, in including in dun sa pagpaplano ng isang city. Kasi Baguio is very, I mean, special, not only dun sa yung, pagiging, yung cultural aspect niya. Kas, uh, kasi ito lang yung city that I think are reporting that there are endemic species in the city. So parang Dabao, of course, is popular of the Philippine Eagle, pero Manila, yung Manila, hindi mo wala na. Parang hindi, hindi ka na makapagpanggit ng mga ng wildlife. So I think uh, it will just take time for, for wildlife species to become also uh, as important as the other species na meron tayo. Ano pa yung isa? Ay, so nasagot ko na dyan, no? Sir, meron pang isa. I think idagdag na natin. Ah, sige, sige. Will the endemic true species be able to travel down from one pine forest fragment to another? Um, that's a very interesting question. Yes, in the presence of what we call corridor uh, or bridges. So a bridge can be in the form of uh, parang a stream bank. So if you have a stream, there's a vegetation along the stream, connecting one fragment to the other, then that is a very important pathway for our endemic species to travel to and from fragments. Can they also travel pababa, sir? <laughs> I mean, they uh, can go to other 
other areas. We, we know they are they can only be found in the Cordillera. But yeah, we can also see um, Cagayan, Iloco, uh, you at the endemic species then as although wala hindi pa kasi kami masyadong bumababa or at least hindi namin na kumpleto yung um yung elevational gradient nyo. but by knowing that there are no species of of, of uh, for example yung Crotomys white head eye dahil walang species na ganun sa lowland so ibig sabihin meron lang din siyang limit ng tolerance probably in terms of yung temperature mga ganyan but upon Miss Abre yung isa kanina na sinabi kong mahaba yung whiskers we we recorded individuals as low as Santa Maria Ilocos Sur so dati akala namin parang Cordillera lang siya kasi it was first discovered in in of course in Abra that's the word Abre yung pangalan niya Pero nung the field work kami sa, sa Ilocos, mababa na Santa Maria is near vegan area. Ang daming la doon. So I think may mga species naman na endemic natin na kahit sinabi nilang early discovered na Cordillera siya because we are doing more field work na nakikita namin na yung range nila ng distribution could, um, could be much wider than we, we thought to. Pero the Crotomys white head eye, mukhang yun ay talagang dito lang sa higher elevation of Cordillera. The lowest record that we have is maybe about 900 meters elevation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, yeah, so nagmamigrate din yung mga, like, possibly nagmigrate yung ilang mga species pababa. Possibly. Okay, so thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, now we we go back to Miss Verna. Uh, Ma'am Verna, may tanong dito. Uh, how is Baguio City a catalyst of local and regional development and what could be the role of Cordillera in the creative city development trajectory? Um, before, before it became a creative city, Baguio is really kind of, it's a center, right? In, uh, in the region in terms of uh, development. So universities are here, most businesses are here. But for the creative city, Medyo uh, yung bagyo yung kumukuha, meaning ito yung nagbe-benefit. No, because the, the the products that we, for example, the products are that are in, for example, in Mande Coquito, some some artworks, ganyan, hindi naman sila lahat bagyo-based. And the culture that is being promoted there is not just bagyo. So therefore, um, if bagyo promotes these products, these cultures, then it is also promoting... Um, uh, the culture of the indigenous people. Yun nga lang kailangan ng proper... Uh, yun, nababanggit na rin kanina that there needs to be a plan wherein, wherein naka-identify lahat ito. But definitely, yes, Baguio is a catalyst for local and regional development even before it became a creative city. And now, it's it's like... Um, um, it is... Uh, it is continuing that through uh, its promotion of cultural and creative industries. Thank you, Ma'am Verna. Uh, to architect Donna naman, may tal dalawang talong po from, from Dean Leia and also from our colleague, Ms. Jiraya Gray. Uh, will it be okay if you talk more about samples of what has been mapped in the cultural mapping project in the city? And the second po, Ma'am Donna, is uh, could we know more about the utilization workshop and when it might be held? I think... Uh, a colleague of ours wanted to 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 participate in in this endeavor. Yes, uh, thank you for that. You know. um, the utilization workshop uh, we're arranging it with NCCA because they will facilitate is it. Um, I think it will be in October. So uh, rest assured, po na invited ang uh, UP Baguio. So uh, we will also post it over sa. Uh, public information office para po those who are interested who might not be uh, a part of the academy, eh, pwede pong uh, mag-join din. Uh, we will make the crowd bigger po this time because uh, the first validation workshop uh, we received po requests then na uh, sana nakasama sila so we learned from that. It will be a bigger uh, workshop especially for utilization because that's uh, very important. No, uh, We plot out already uh, where do we intend to use this, uh, uh, what uh, we have mapped already? And then uh, for other samples, uh, you want to see pa ibang mga examples of what was mapped? 
um, shall I share my screen? I chose um, two. Yes, ma'am. Yes, po. Okay. So um, this is another example. Uh, can you see it? So a uh, map mapping naman ito of significant, tangible, movable heritage. So this is on industrial and commercial arts. So uh, what we map here is um ayaw yung mouse ko. Is the 1950 G German Holner four bass ten button accordion. So ito yung photos niya. And then um so more of its photos. I, the year it was produced, 1950s, its estimated age, the owner of the um, article, the type of acquisition. So binili ito sa Phil Indian store. Uh, if we, you siguro yung mga oldies, <laughs> if you still remember Phil Indian store. Uh, description of the object, uh, nakasama yan. So it's uh, quite uh, a long uh, description of what it is. So even measurements were taken aside from the photographs that were taken so that's uh, what uh, we were able to uh, get and then um reads uh the parts of the accordion and then uh the bellows the keys and the buttons so the other parts as well and then uh we always very um templated it off from ncca lot ng parts niya um, we, you should be able to put something. Kaya uh, very thorough yung research nito. So yung part three is narratives, the stories, beliefs, practices associated with that. So uh, yun, yun yung story niya. No? It was owned by a German. They learned to play it. So and so the favorite song they played there is O Susana. <laughs> yung mga nakuha dyan. So um Significance niya. So sa significance, we have to qualify it um, uh, to several primary criteria. First is historical significance. So uh, it was discussed here. Uh, even the aesthetic significance is also uh, part of the um, documentation niya. The scientific significance is also an important element, social, kasama rin yan. So uh, we have to make sure now uh, with the mapper thoroughly understood and they ask the necessary questions para uh, they would be able to fill up itong part na ito. So uh, meron ding part on comparative criteria. Uh, this part is on provenance, representativeness, the rarity. No? So may discussion din siya how rare is this um, object as well as uh, interpretative potential. And then conservation status niya. Uh, this one, uh, we look at the uh, uh, the accordion and you can see na we already uh, set out kung ano yung mga uh, conditions that are already uh, physically present dun sa um, accordion. And uh, meron din siyang uh, discussion on, uh, on it. And then uh, we also put in uh, parts on challenges, threats and issues, and conservation measures and the more important references again so that is uh, for uh, that um, element or that domain may isa pa ako um, this time on hmm. so dali ha hanapin ko lang yung isa Uh, this other one which I have is on natural forms. So um, mapping of significant uh, natural resources. So we map the seven hills of Baguio. Do you know that Baguio has seven hills like Rome? Uh, so uh, this one is um, Cabinet Hill. So we have uh, the satellite image of Cabinet Hill. Um, there is that section on the background information, its location, its land area, the ownership of that uh, particular uh, part of the city. So a description of what is uh, Cabinet Hill. So we get back to the records, uh, LRA, as well as the history ng barangay. So we also added here part three is on um, stories associated with the 
land formation. So this is very important, no? Uh, because of course, uh, the best way we can uh, remember a place on our or an object is uh, what are the stories associated with it. So, uh, meron yung uh, approval of government to legalize Cabinet Hill as a barangay. Uh, there is that story about World War II liberation and then Cabinet Hill before development. So, yan yung uh, namap. And then significance. So, very um, particular sila on significance, historical, aesthetic, and social. Meron pang uh, iba depending on what would qualify as significant for this uh, particular um, element. And then uh, status of conservation. So uh, may discussion sila on the cleanup drives because the Cabinet Hill is a uh, an area where uh, a river runs through. So merong discussions on Salaknib ni Waig. And then uh, constraints and threats issues. Ito na yung very important sa amin no? uh, when we do the barangay uh, development plan because uh, we know already paano ba ang uh, protection measures or development measures which we could incorporate given that it's part of the mapping already. It should be protected. So naturally, we will have to look into yung threats so that we can solve these issues. And then conservation measures, uh, ang emphasis nila ito is the creek. So yung mga waterways natin sa city, somehow um, malaki na yung challenge on that no? because uh, even the ismets have been built over already. So that's something that uh, this is very useful. And then, of course, the references. So I mentioned earlier, we look for the oldest member of the community. So in this case, Mr. Kalasikas is seven years old. No? And he's uh, been a kagawad and a punong barangay uh, in his time. So uh, we also note down the name of the mapper as well as the date that it was formed. So that's another thing. Um, so it, there's so many, you know, 230. Siguro, uh, if you like, uh, especially Ma'am uh, Professor Dean Avayo, uh, if you like, um, we can set up a, you know, a, uh, a discussion, uh, something like that. Uh, we can go through. Or we well, now we finish the uh, proofreading of uh, the uh, proofs. Ito malibro which we launched on uh, September one. Para po we can give you. Uh, the city will give all of the universities po a copy of this one. Thank you po. Thank you very much, Architect Donna. Uh, very exciting to also conduct cultural mapping not only in Baguio but in other parts of uh, the Cordillera and the Philippines uh, in general. So uh, I think uh, Ma'am Weng is raising her hand earlier. Ma'am Weng, are you there po? Hi, Ma'am Weng. Okay. Mom, yes, can you, I speak? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll try to make it very brief. But uh, uh, architect Donna, uh, CSC did a research on Happy Hollow in the distant past. I don't know if you got to hold, uh, have a copy of the paper. So, hindi lang galing sa Basaw at Ipugaw ang naandoon sa Happy Hollow in the early 1900s. I was in fact asked by some locals why the Kalanguyas were not being mentioned, especially the women. Okay? So, maganda malaman mo yun na in fact, pwedeng balikan kasi ang ganda-ganda ng study namin doon on. We in fact talked about the Ruhr, uh, Rurban livelihood, rurban, rur, rural urban. So, sang um, RCPP at the Kadi, marami pang pwedeng mabanggit about Happy Hollow and the other communities. So that's one. Number two, hindi ko alam kung ginagamit niyo yung ginawa na study on uh, Baguio City heritage sites and structures. Ang dami-dami na namin na ilagay doon na suggestions din na pwedeng next steps 
So we don't know if that was done. And in fact, we had a very close ties with the team from NCCA, okay? Especially for the uh, Central Business District area and up to uh, uh, post office. Next, my comments then ako sa uh, Creative City, pero Vera, uh, maghahanap ako ng standards sa sinasabi mo, sa comments mo, kasi dapat meron din ma-develop ma ng metrics, baka si architect doon na can also have some guidance, give, give guidance to work on creative cities. Kasi hindi lang basta enumeration yan. In the same way that in the uh, presentation of um, uh, Sir Aris, uh, and dami pa rin pwedeng link ng, uh, na interdisciplinary, no? social science and uh, biology. So, sana magkaroon ng time for roundtable discussion because heritage is really the link nature and culture. So talagang magkadikit yan. Nagbibigayan, nagtutulungan yan. So yun lang gusto kong i-comment. Ay, ay, nang bitin na bitin ako, hindi kami makapag-discuss ng mahaba, but I'm very willing to have um, chat uh, with any of you for some ideas na pwede pa namin i-share. Kaming matatanda na. Sayang eh. Yun lang po. Sal oh, salamat. Okay na ba? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma'am Weng. Any reaction po from architect Donna? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I always uh, would like to thank po uh, Dr. Bokiren for pointing us out dun sa mga studies that had been done before. Yes po, we actually have, uh, you graciously shared to us yung study nyo po on um, uh, cultural mapping dun sa Central Business District uh, nagamit po namin yan. And uh, we are uh, grateful po dun sa recommendations nyo. Uh, for Happy Halo po, uh, we're still uh, starting with uh, yung development po ng ads DPP nila. But rest assured po that uh, we will uh, look into yung uh, study po uh, which you mentioned dito sa Happy Halo. In fact, uh, very important po ng mga inputs ito. Thank you po. Okay. Uh, thank you very much po. Uh, my, there's also another question uh, kay architect uh, Donna ulit. My question lang siguro from Prof. Semi uh, Bawanan. If specific indigenous management practices of resources were being documented po ba? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you po for mentioning that because uh, I think hindi po very thorough yung nangyari. Uh, it's part of the discussion like, like, like just uh, say for example sa Happy Hollow. But we can actually add po. Uh, that gave me an idea already that we can add that sa book 2 natin. Uh, kasi very important po yan. Uh, indigenous management practices. Input po yan dun sa sinasabi kong possible na indigenous uh, land use and zoning. So yes ma'am. Thank you very much po for that. Uh, I will list it down po dito sa magiging book to natin. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, architect. Kasi I, I was also thinking that uh, this could be a good opportunity also for our in, uh, courses in the conservation and restoration ecology. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Thank Indeed. you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. And also, there's a comment here from our dean. Thank you very much, architect Donna. Inspiring to know about your cultural mapping work. Maraming salamat po for finding time to join this event. And maraming salamat din po, Dean, uh, and of course, UP Baguio for inviting me. Uh, it's only through this um, fora na, na nakikita rin kung ano din yung efforts ng city. And uh, I'm very uh, thankful po always uh, yung, uh, the uh, comments coming from uh, the academy most especially 
lalo na po uh, nare-redirect kami especially kung medyo off po yung ginagawa namin. Thank you po. Uh, I hope na gawin niyo po kaming mainstay sa mga lecture series niyo po para we could also uh, see and hear and incorporate uh, what's being discussed. Uh, in fact po, like what I said earlier, I have notes of all presentations. I promise po that uh, this is a uh, point for consideration po dun sa planning activities na ginagawa dito sa city. Thank you po. Thank you very much, Architect uh, Donna. And with that, uh, we are going to close our uh, Q&A portion and we are going to proceed to the awarding of Certificate of Appreciation to our uh, presenters this afternoon. So... So while waiting po, I hope that uh, those of you uh, have already answered the evaluation form. And after that, we can send the evaluation form sa ating uh, CSS lecture series uh, email, which is posted on uh, the chat box. And yeah, if you want to receive e-certificate, uh, please accomplish the uh, evaluation form. So sir my certificate of appreciation okay thank you very much so again uh 113th Baguio charter day anniversary lecture certificate of appreciation is awarded to dr aris a reginaldo for sharing invaluable findings and insight from the research work during the 113th celebration of baguio Char charter day held jointly by the college of social sciences and the college of science on 9th of September 2022, virtually signed Professor Jose Matli Luga, Chairperson CSS Lecture Series, and Dr. Leia Abayo, Dean College of Social Sciences. So let's give him a virtual uh, applause sa ating mga uh, presenters. Next, a certificate uh, awarded to uh, Ms. Vernalisa Bautista. Okay. And then last, uh, the certificate is awarded to architect Donna Tabang. Thank you very much, Po. And uh, to culminate this uh, 113th Baguio Chapter Day Anniversary Lecture Series, I would like to call on our Dean, Dean Leia Abaya, for uh, the closing remarks. Maraming salamat, Joao. Thank you for reaching at this point. Uh, two panels in a day, uh, moderating two panels in a day. I know this is that's not easy to do. Um, thank you for accepting our challenge. Uh, I know that we have given you this. Uh, it's our, kasalanan namin ni Matthew yan biglang. O si, Matt, si Joao na lang ulit. And you did this again last year. Yes. But we're <laughs> very happy that uh, we did this uh, on behalf of uh, Youth Baguio and the College of Social Sciences. Um, I would really stop, uh, I'd really, I, I would like to thank our speakers. Maraming salamat talaga sa pagbabahagi ng iyong mga kaalaman. Uh, lalong lalo ito ang mga bago or recent studies on Baguio. Uh, and that's what we want to do for an annual event on Baguio. Uh, our desire is to, um, to, to host every year uh, in September. Uh, uh, recent studies on Baguio conducted by uh, the faculty of UB Baguio as well as other researchers and it was really um, our desire to have architect Donna present the uh, cultural mapping project because we know that it's uh, one of the most recent projects being done in Baguio and we know that everyone is interested in heritage. Uh, so we are really honored to have that presentation as well for today. Um, I know that my colleagues are excited about uh, the presentations on heritage uh, because we have now seen a menu of presentations from natural heritage uh, and built heritage. So I'm sure my colleagues, Prof. Aris, uh, Prof. Seni, may mga iniisip na ang mga ito and they might be contacting 
architect doon na uh, and the LGU of Baguio about this. Uh, kaninang umaga pa lang, uh, o kahapon, excited na si Prof. Ari. Sabi niya, I'm excited if um, uh, our researches can also reach or can be used by the LGUs. So I hope that these kinds of events, our conversations today, um, will translate into some um, inputs to uh, programs and projects by the uh, communities, by the local governments. And this is really what we want to do uh, at the College of Social Sciences, uh, not just to do public lectures, but to desire um, that our conversations today and the researches that have been done by, uh, by scholars will also be useful and will be or will be used by um, concerned uh, institutions, communities, um, and agencies. So we hope that this platform can lead us to uh, collaborate, collaborative work, um, volunteering work as well. I know that uh, this has been, um, th there's been openings for volunteering um, in Baguio, and I hope we can uh, ins give more inspiration to this kind of thinking. Um, so thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, thank you participants for joining us. We hope you can still join us for the next activities that the College of Social Sciences and UP Baguio will um, sponsor. Um, we'll be hosting one more event in October and in this uh, in October for the National Indigenous Peoples Month and um, sometime in November as well. Uh, we'll, we, if you send us or if you would like to join our, our email list, which is in the registration, you will be receiving information on this. But we normally post our events on the Facebook page of the College of Social Sciences and uh, as well as the other colleges. So just tune in there and we'll, you'll know our next events. Um, um, so thank you, everyone. And finally, I would uh, like to thank uh, Professor Matthew Luga, who's been on top of this uh, event. Uh, Professor Matthew Luga and his colleagues at the CSS Lecture Series uh, Committee, who, who worked very hard to organize um, this um, event for today. So thank you, our speakers. Thank you, participants. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Dean. And uh, yeah. Uh, we would like to extend our gratitude to our speakers, to those who attended here in the Zoom meeting and also in Facebook Live. We hope to see you again in our next uh, lecture or webinar, and we hope to have an engaging and contribute to uh, the society of Baguio also uh, in general. So before we and officially end this uh, uh, lecture series, we would like to have a photo opportunity with all of us so that we will have, a, you know, parang a souvenir <laughs> to remind ourselves that we are, or we have become part of this uh, lecture series. Uh, so mga Sir Matt, mga, uh, tayo lang ba? Or is kasama natin yung mga participants? Okay, sige. So, yeah. So, who will take the picture? Professor? I'll do it na po. Yeah, okay. So, I hope Prof. Aris can on his camera. <laughs> but if not, then... Hala ka, Aris. Baka cloud rat ang lalabas dyan. <laughs> <laughs> May ibon na po. <laughs> okay, so I will just um I'll just save this at the uh, paint no. So one up Simon Jura Hey Jay. Yeah, all right. Thank you. So one, two, three. Okay, just let me save this and then I'll take another one for insurance twenty twenty two on the SPN session. One more, one, two. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. So, visual. Thank you very much, Po. And uh, if you want to get your e certificate, please accomplish the evaluation form. Maraming, maraming salamat and have a good day.
Thank you. Bye. Bye, Zen. Thank you. Bye, po. Thank you, po. Ulit, <laughs> Thank Zen. you, Zen. Nakakatuwa. Thank you, Joao. I'm sure. Sana may yeah. ganito ulit na inter-college next team. Oo oh, nga, eh. Oo. Kasi na, na, cool, no? natin yung buo <laughs> ng Baguio. Correct. Oo. Nakakatuwa. So, tingnan nyo may magtatanong sa cloud rat ni Ari.